morning. Everybody doing okay? You guys good? Good? All right. All right. Good to see you this morning. So, a little bit more than halfway through the book of Revelation, if you've been with me. Before I get into that, I got I to tell you a funny story because someone was picking on me this morning because I have no shoes on, but I also have my little sweater thing on. And that's because when I get here on Sunday morning, or this morning, it was, you know, 38 degrees when I got here this morning, so you need a little sweater thing. Uh, but it'll be like 75 degrees when I leave, so no shoes. So you have to kind of dress for both. And um, that made me think of a wardrobe story that I told uh, at the eight. And uh, a couple of years ago, so I, I get pretty nervous before I get up here and speak. I speak five times a weekend, been doing it for 15 years, and I uh, still haven't been able to shake the, the nervousness. So you don't care to hear any of this, but, I, but I, 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 I pee before every service. So I go into the bathroom right over here, and I use the bathroom because I'm nervous. So, um, and I know you don't care to hear that. So, uh, but, but the rest of the story doesn't make sense if I don't tell you that. So I was in the bathroom over here a couple of years ago. I, I used the bathroom. I go to zip up my jeans, and the whole zipper comes off, like off. It was halfway through the last song, Kyle's about to start praying. I'm holding my zipper in the bathroom going. So they run in and get Kyle's attention and they're like, you know, so Kyle's stretching that prayer out at the end real long. And I'm sitting here figuring out what to do and people are scrambling. I remember, this is a true story. Mitch runs up with pliers and a stapler. And he, <laughs> he runs up and I'm like, dude, what are you doing with that? Like, oh, stay away from me. And um and so it was, it was crazy. It was nuts. And I remember um, after that, they bought a, it was like a SWAT team grade backpack. This is a true story. You can go back and see it in the security office if you ever want to. And there's a patch that says Trimble Emergency Bag. And it has jeans in it. And it has safety pins. And it has everything you need just in case uh, this happens again. So I remember after it happened, I got up in front of, you know, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's few things worse than knowing you're going to have to get up in front of thousands and thousands of people over three services on Sunday. You know, it didn't happen on Saturday, thank God, but uh, on Sunday and um, get up there with your, your fly unzipped. So I remember just getting up here and going, hey, everyone, my, my zipper is broke. It's open. So I'm not going to lift my hands. I'm going to keep my shirt down like this. Keep your eyes up here, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and, we made, and we made it through. So, uh, you yeah. know. That sucked. That was bad. All right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we are working through the book of Revelation. We, we crossed the halfway point last weekend. We did chapter 11. Let me give you a, a quick update as to where we are, and then I want to talk to you just a minute bit about, about chapter 12, because it is a, a very unique chapter in Revelation, and that's saying a lot in Revelation, but this is a very unique chapter, and we'll get to that here in a second. Okay, so there are three sets of events that Revelation kind of centers around. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, right? These three sets of events. In chapter 8, we get into the second set of events, which are the trumpets. Chapter 8 tells us about the first four. They are ecological disasters, which means things that happen to the land, to the sea, to the fresh water, to the sky, okay? In chapter 9, we get into the fifth and sixth trumpets. These are spiritual attacks. Basically, the fifth and sixth trumpet are two different kinds of demons that will be unleashed unto the earth. The first one has the ability to hurt but not kill. The second one, second one it says, has the ability to kill, which leads us to believe it is more than likely demonically possessed people. That's the, sixth, uh, the fifth and sixth trumpets. In chapter 10, we have a break. And if you were with me for chapter 9, you kind of need a break after chapter 9. That's a pretty heavy chapter. In chapter 10, we get a break. John is on the earth. An angel comes down, offers him a scroll. We talked about what that scroll represents. That represents John's responsibility to communicate revelation to us. It is uh, basically him accepting his role as a prophet, to, to prophesy about the revelation of Jesus Christ. In chapter 11... Very interesting chapter, very complicated chapter, heavy chapter. Uh, we, we encounter two witnesses. I believe they're more than likely literal two men who are in a new Babylon, a, a kind of an epicenter of a city in the future sometime, and they are preaching the gospel for three and a half years. They are murdered in the streets. They lie, lie dead in the streets for three and a half days. 
They are resurrected. It says there is an earthquake and the seventh trumpet blows. Now we know, because an angel said this previously in Revelation, that when the seventh trumpet is blown, that is the end. That is the signal of the end. And this happens in chapter 11. Now, if you've been with me, you're like, well, wait a second. We're only halfway through Revelation. How can the story end already? And I talked to you a little bit about this last weekend, though I didn't use this word and I should have. It's called the recapitulation view, which means chapters 6 through 11 are the seven years of the Great Tribulation, right, told. And then chapters 13 through 18 are the same seven years told from a different vantage point. So the first half of Revelation is kind of told from a heavenly vantage point. The second half of Revelation is kind of told from an earthly vantage point, okay? Now, in between those two vantage points, you have chapter 12, which is a very, very interesting chapter. Chapter 12 is often called an epic drama, and we'll talk about this a little bit more once we get reading and getting into it. Here's the way I view chapter 12, and you may think this is kind of corny or cheesy, uh, but it helps me understand it a little bit better. Chapter 12 is kind of the, the, the middle point, the intermission of the entire book of Revelation. And essentially what John sees is a vision of a play, or if you want to think of it in more modern terms, like a film, a long film. And it is this epic battle of good and evil, God versus the devil. And he has seen this whole thing kind of unfold. And so that's what chapter 12 is. So in my opinion, the best way to help me understand chapter 12 is to think of it in that way. Almost like John is sitting back and he is watching this epic drama unfold in front of him, like you're seeing a movie or like you're seeing a very dramatic play. That's what he's seeing, okay? And we'll get into the details about that here in a moment. So, should have got a notes handout. Everything is in there. Everything will be on the screen. Everything's on the app, the website. If you have your Bible, we're in the very back. We're in chapter 12. Um, it's a neat chapter. It's an interesting chapter. It's a mishmash. Um, and we'll talk about all that here in a second. But before that, let's pray. And we will dive into it. Thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate it. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in, okay? Father God, we love you. Lord, I genuinely thank you for, uh, for all the people in this room this morning. Thank you, God, for our great prayer night Friday, Lord, and thank you for that time with lots of people praying. I pray that was a blessing to you, God, and to our city. Father, um, we just thank you for today. We pray that you keep your hand on us, God. We thank you for this place that we get to come and, and learn and worship God in safety and, and, and in comfort. Father, we pray not just for our church. We pray for every single church in our city. We pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities. And we just pray that we are a blessing to you, God. We pray that what we do today honors you and that we don't just speak of our faith, Father. I pray that we live our faith and we demonstrate our faith. We love you. We praise you. Pray all these things in your name, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a second when you get kind of this. You, it almost seems cinematic when I read it, okay? We'll read this first part, and we'll go back and talk about it. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor in agony as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, notice capital S there, a male who is going to rule the nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be nourished there for 1,260 days, roughly three and a half years, okay? So here's what makes chapter 12 very interesting and also uh, could be a little confusing. It is a blend of things that are literal, things that are metaphorical, things from the past, things from the future, things from the present, and they are all kind of squished together. So the reason why I say that is we can't really take chapter 12 as systematic theology, which means we shouldn't get our hardcore doctrine and timeline from chapter 12, 
Okay, that's not what it's meant to be. It is meant to be an epic, dramatic kind of play or display for John of the battle between good and evil, the battle between God and the devil. And it's kind of played out with these different characters and figures that can mean several different things. So different times in chapter 12, something can actually have dual meanings. And and again, it's just, uh, uh, it's not meant to be taken as systematic doctrine. So the first half of the epic drama takes place in heaven. The drama begins in the heavens. It will eventually move to earth. Remember what I said. The second half of Revelation takes place from an earthly vantage point. And that's where we're going to stay until about chapter 18. The first sign or character that John sees is a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. This is the most confusing character, if you will, in the epic drama. Now, Catholics would more than likely believe this is Mary, and and the 12 stars are the 12 disciples. Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior, would believe this is representative of Israel and the 12 tribes. Most Protestants, which would be the majority of us in this room, would believe this represents the church and that the stars are the followers of Jesus. And then you have yet another group of people who think all of it is symbolic. I'm talking all of the book of Revelation. And they would think Revelation is cyclical. If you remember me talking about that many, many months ago when we began Revelation, some people view Revelation as cyclical, that this is a metaphor for good versus evil from generation to generation. So the woman is just a a heroic female character that defeats evil, right? And they see it as, as all symbolic, okay? Now, to be fair, there's going to be a blend of some of these things as we go through chapter 12. So it says the woman was pregnant and about to give birth. The child of the woman is the third character, and it's a very easily distinguishable one. Son with a capital S. It's going to be Jesus, right? The second character is also pretty easy to identify. The antagonist is a great fiery red dragon. Who can that be? Well, many cultures teach about dragons. Many cultures, many world religions have mythologies and and, and stories about dragons. The Bible, though, is specific on who this dragon is. This dragon is Satan. It's going to tell us in the next portion that we're going to read. Now, here's where people start to speculate things, and here's where people get intrigued, right? And they try to crack the code. It says that the the dragon had seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on its seven heads. Now, the number seven does mean a lot in the book of Revelation. Now, we don't need to get crazy with numbers, as we're going to see in chapter 13. We need to be careful when we start hyper-focusing on numbers. But the number seven in the Bible does mean something. It typically means perfection, right? Or fullness. So the fact that it had seven heads, it shows that our enemy, the antagonist, the devil, is very wise, very smart, very cunning, very crafty. On the seven heads were seven crowns. The translated word for that is diadems. And this is not symbols of perfect victory. This is symbols of perfect understanding. So so let me pause there for a second. What we learn is that the devil is not stupid. The devil is very crafty, very cunning, right? Uh, Very manipulative. And then the number 10, the 10 horns, horns represent power. This shows extreme power. Now, there are more concrete things that this probably also represents. We'll talk about that here in a second. But let's keep talking about more of these kind of metaphorical things that they represent. The seven heads may also represent empires. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel prophesies that before the Messiah comes back, seven global empires will rise and fall. Now, this is very interesting if you're a history person. Now, there have been many empires that have risen and fallen over time, but very few of them have been global. What I mean by global is when Egypt was a a global power, an empire, they were in control of the known world. Now, there were probably humans scattered in places very far away from them, but over the known world, over the civilized world, Egypt was in charge, right? So here are the seven empires. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, which was when Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. He was under the Persian Empire. Greece, 
Rome, that's when John wrote the book of Revelation, the Roman Empire was in charge. And then there's only one global empire left. Now, if you're a historian, it's been about 1,500 years since the, the, the fall of Rome, right? So Rome has been gone for a long time. So there's been a long stint of time where we haven't had a global empire. And we don't really have a global empire now, but there will come one in the future, right? A, a one world government. And that will rise and it will fall and you'll see, the, uh, you'll see the return of Christ. So the 10 horns and the seven crowns. Most scholars on Revelation believe the 10 horns are political institutions, governments, and they will unite under one leader, the Antichrist. Now, this is where people start to really speculate what 10 countries are it, and they try to put it together and they try to figure it out. The seven crowns are more than likely the leaders of 10 different governments. Well, you have 10 political institutions. Why are there not 10 leaders? Well, three of those countries, the Bible predicts, will consolidate into one, making only seven crowns, okay? Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. When we get into chapter 13 and 14 and beyond, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Now, it says, the dragon swept away a third of the stars, more than likely, the first half of chapter four. Chapter four is interesting because we're going to see in chapter four just how much of a mashup Revelation chapter 12 is. Just in chapter four, you're going to see the past. You're going to see things from very, very distant past. You're going to see things that are literal. You're going to see things that are metaphorical. Verse A is more than likely referring to when Satan was cast out of heaven. Now, this happened pre-Genesis. If it happened pre-Genesis, how do we know it happened? It mentions it in Ezekiel, mentions it in Isaiah, briefly mentions it in one of the Gospels, Satan getting cast down like lightning. And so when he was cast down from heaven, Satan took a third of the angels with him, right? Those are what we call demons now. Now, the second half of chapter four shows us just how evil the devil is. Now, there is some very uh, graphic, provocative one may even say disturbing imagery in Revelation. And chapter four is one of those accounts. Think about, I mean, maybe not think about it too much, but you can imagine how evil and disgusting this is. We have the imagery of a woman who is about to give birth to a child. And then the antagonist of the story hovers over the woman waiting for the child to be born. Why? So it can destroy the child, devour the child. That is very sick, disturbing imagery, and it's meant to be. The reason why it's meant to be is it shows us just how evil the devil is. And if we understand that he is that evil, right, that he would devour a, a newborn child, I think we need to be very cautious on how we joke around about the devil. What do I mean by that? You know, Halloween's rolling around, and this will offend some of you and liberate others of you. Um, when my kids were smaller, we would take them trick-or-treating, right? Mostly because as a parent, you get, you know, a fraction of that candy for yourself, and you don't really have to do any work. So, uh, you know, our kids would dress up as, you know, princesses or whatever, and we'd, we'd go around the neighborhood and we'd trick-or-treat. One thing we were always very cautious about uh, when it came to this time of the year and when it came to trick-or-treating is never anything demonic, never anything about the devil. There's, there's nothing cute about that. And you would see people who would dress up their kids with like the little devil tail and the horns, like, oh, how cute. And there's nothing cute about that. The devil would absolutely tear up your child if he could get to your child. So there's nothing cute or funny or, or, or anything about that. We often do that in cartoons and I love old cars. I've got a couple old hot rods and even in the hot rod world, a lot of stuff about the devil and a lot of stickers and, you know, hood ornaments and stuff like that. And like, I just don't mess with that stuff because it is nothing to joke about. It is something that we should take pretty seriously. The devil's objective is to steal, kill, destroy. That's it. And we should, we should take that a little bit more serious than we probably do sometimes. Another thing about verse four is it may literally be referring to a historical event on earth. So some scholars believe that the second part of verse four is a reference to King Herod waiting for Mary to give birth to Jesus so he can go kill the baby. And that would allude to the fact that not only was Herod evil, but, but all evil antagonists of Jesus are ultimately driven by the devil, by Satan. And so verse four alone has a lot packed into it. So the third character is obvious. It says the sun. 
It's Jesus, right? Not only does it have a capital S, so we know it's Jesus, it also quotes what is written in Psalms and Galatians that he will rule the nations with an iron rod. So we absolutely know that it's referring to Jesus right there. And it says that her child was caught up to God. And some people are bothered by that phraseology because if you were just reading this, you would go, well, why did Jesus have to run away from the devil? Was he scared? And of course, we know that he's not scared. We know that God is not scared. It actually shows the opposite. It shows that there was a, a grand design, a plan to how all of this is going to unfold. And we learn that. We're reaffirmed that here in the next section, okay? It also says the, women fled, or the woman fled to the wilderness. Now, I think this means a couple of things. I think literally, when you go back and read the story of Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph had to flee to Egypt in fear for their child being killed. This, in, this can also refer to the ostracization, right? Or, 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 or people separating themselves from Christians during the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, that we will be ostracized, we will be put off in a wilderness. Now, that, can, that, that, that could be literal. There might come a time to where it is so hostile for us if we're alive during that time that we may have to get off the grid a little bit, right? You preppers are like, come on, I'm ready. That we may have to get off the grid a little bit. Or, <laughs> or it, may, it may be more figurative, that maybe socially we are off the grid. And I think we're already going that direction, that in more urban areas, it will become increasingly difficult to be a Christian. If you guys notice, if you're from big cities, uh, the bigger a city gets, uh, the popularity of Christian values tends to diminish. Uh, I'm from St. Louis originally. That's a, that's a pretty, pretty good-sized city. Um, it's hard to do churches in areas like that. There's more crime. There's more divorce. There's things like this. The principles of Christ are not exercised as well as populations tend to grow some like that in, in, in concentrated areas. So, so maybe this is not that we're not literally in cities, but socially we are kind of cast out is what that could be referring to, okay? All right, let's go on to the next part. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. So there you go. We know exactly who that is. The one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. Verse 11 is very important. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth, warning, right? Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great fury because he knows his time is short. There's a lot in this section too. So the drama intensifies, just like, again, imagine again like this is a like cinematic or a play. Any good story, any good play, any good movie, the action intensifies, the drama intensifies. And so this section blends things from the past, again, things from the present, things from the future. This section also brings to light scripture that we often say in church, but we don't really think about it very much. Ephesians 6.12 that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, that our war is a spiritual war, not a physical war. And so though Satan had taken a third of heaven, Michael, the archangel, overthrows the devil and casts him out of the heavens. Okay, so it's not even Jesus that does this. Michael casts Satan out of the heavens. And what we learn is, is that Satan is not confined to hell. Satan and his demons are not confined to hell. What they are doing, sounds crazy, they are all around the earth, right? And they're trying to destroy the people of the earth. 
So who is this adversary and what are his best tactics? Listen, if you haven't heard anything I say, if you're a Christian here, I think you need to hear this part. This part's pretty important. The word devil literally translates to slanderer. That means to gossip and speak bad about other people, okay? The word Satan literally translates to accuser. That means blame other people. The two greatest tactics of the devil are to talk bad about people, gossip about people, and and put blame on people, accuse them. And when we, listen to me, when we, even as Christians, gossip, slander, and constantly blame others, we cannot act more like the devil than that. Everybody awake? Good? That's by definition. We are acting more like the devil than anything else we do. That's why the scripture even says that the Holy Spirit needs to tame the tongue that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to get a hold of our tongue because the tongue is a very divisive, destructive part of our body, right? And Christians need to get a grip on their tongue, okay? Because when we don't, we're acting like the devil. We are acting like the antagonist. So in verse 10 through 12, John is interrupted by a voice from heaven. And John probably needs a break at this point, right? (laughs) You're doing all a revelation. He's seen this dramatic thing unfold. He probably needs to take a, a, a chill pill for a moment. And so he gets a couple of verses where this voice interrupts. You know what this makes me think of? If we're thinking of chapter 12, like John watching a movie or a play, you ever gone back and watched a movie that, that, that you've seen before, a movie that was very, maybe it was a thriller, it was very dramatic, it was an action movie, and you find out after you've seen it that, that the good guy wins. And then the next time you go back and watch that movie, you still love the movie, maybe even you love it a little bit more because you're not dealing with that anxiety of who's going to win. You know the good guy's going to win. So what happens in the middle of the drama is a voice interrupts John and goes, hey, John, don't worry, the good guy wins, right? The ultimate victor is going to be Jesus. All the authority rests with Jesus. Salvation comes and humanity can be saved through Jesus. So it's almost like in the middle of this epic drama, John gets to go, okay, all right, we're, we're gonna win. Everything's gonna be okay. Jesus is victorious. I can continue to watch this drama unfold. And that's very interesting. We're also told how we are able to live victoriously with Christ in this battle. So so here's the thing, is our epic drama that we call life starts to unfold, we are told how to be victorious in life and how to be victorious over the forces of hell. This may be one of the most important scriptures in the entire word of God. This is a very important scripture, verse 11. It says that we overcome the forces of hell, how? How? by the blood of the lamb that Jesus Christ shed on the cross and by the word of our testimony, by sharing that with other people. So angels defeated Satan in heaven. We defeat Satan on earth all the time by remembering what Jesus did on the cross, his work on the cross, and by sharing the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God with other people. That's how we conquer the devil every single day on earth. Now, that part is great and everyone loves it. Jesus loves me. He died on the cross. I want to tell everyone about it. It's fantastic. Then you get to the second part of verse 11. It also says they did not love their lives to the point of death. This means that true Christians understand that they would give everything the world deems valuable, including their own life for the sake of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, that part's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? Man, yeah, Jesus loves me. He died on the cross. I'm gonna tell everyone. And will I do it to the death? Even if it costs me everything, will I still do that? But this is why Jesus said to us in Matthew chapter 10, if you're gonna find your life, you have to be willing to lose it. Now, that doesn't mean you absolutely will get killed for your faith or have to suffer for your faith. God has blessed us in this room and it doesn't feel like suffering right now. But if that were to happen, would I still hold on? Would I still be willing to give up everything for the name of Jesus Christ? Do I not love my life and to the death, right? To the point of death that I'm willing to give it all for a relationship with him. So John warns the people of the earth. Listen, why does John warn the people of the earth? 
Because Satan has been kicked out of the heavens, he's not confined to hell, so what is he gonna do? He is going to unleash great fury on the people on the earth, and he knows his time is short. So Satan is going to use two individuals in particular. He's going to unleash his fury in a lot of ways. He's been doing it for a long time. But towards the end, in the great tribulation, he's going to use two individuals, a beast from the earth or the land or a beast from the sea. And they will bring extreme persecution against the people of God but we understand that his time is short. Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 24. It's gonna be a brief time. It's going to be intense. It's going to be extreme, but it's going to be brief, okay? Because even Jesus says people wouldn't hold on to their salvation if it was going to be for an extended period of time, right? So it's going to be a very short period of time. Now, the reason why the devil is going to redirect his fury to us is he understands that he can't beat God. He can't even beat the angels of God. He couldn't beat Michael. So because he can't beat God and the angels of God, he's going to attack the only thing in the universe that looks like God. It's you. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, in half a time, it's three and a half years, from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river flowing after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from its mouth. So the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Now that word offspring right there, if you have a Bible in front of you, it says offspring and then there is a dash, which means it is about to define that word offspring. How do we uh, define the offspring of God? It says right here, those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. There's the definition. Remember that, we're gonna hang on that at the very end, okay? So the woman is reintroduced into the story. And at this point, I think the woman represents the church. The dragon's attention goes back to her. This is symbolic of Satan's attack on the church. That is both the people of the church, that's us, right? And the institution of the church. So like I said, if Satan cannot destroy God or his angels, He will try to destroy the greatest creation of God, that is humanity, and he will specifically try to destroy the church because that is the bride of Christ, okay? That's what he's going to to go after. It says, though, the woman was given two wings. This is obviously a metaphor. We've seen this metaphor before. In Exodus chapter 19, the Israelites were, were given eagle's wings when they were leaving Egypt and going to Israel. That is a metaphor for God's protection. And it says that God will protect these individuals. It says, time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, that they will be protected. This is another reference to the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. This is mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 and in Daniel chapter 12 as well, okay? And what we see in this imagery is that the persecution from the devil at the end of time, right towards the end of of our time on earth, is going to be extremely severe. This imagery that John writes is, uh, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. It says like a serpent spewing water or maybe even venom, like a river flowing towards the woman to sweep her away in a flood of this venom. Now, verse 16 is interesting. There's a lot of ideas about it. I can't present them all to you. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but verse 16 alludes to that somehow the earth, I'm talking about the earth that we're, that we're standing on, right? That the earth will somehow help the people of God. It'll swallow up this, this sea, this attack, right? This, this water being spewed from the devil. That maybe there will be some kind of geological thing or maybe we will be in a place where we're somehow protected to some extent from this attack from the devil. I don't know. Maybe you know, you can email it to me. I, I have no idea. So then it says that the serpent, the devil, will, will, will redirect, he will wage war against the offspring. I believe that's talking about 
Christians, that's us. So many people believe this means that Satan will move from attacking the institution of the church. Let me pause there for a second. Um, in 2021, 2022, there was a span of, of, of maybe a year or so uh, where I kept reading more and more stories in the news. I don't know if you guys remember this, it was happening. It seemed very, very frequently for about a year um, all kinds of, of mega church pastors and authors were committing suicide. There was a huge run of, of a bunch of, of, of big church leaders committing suicide. Alongside that, there was lots of stories of it coming out where so many worship leaders and pastors were renouncing their faith. Uh, all faith, they became atheists and it still happens a lot. There's a ton of worship leaders. And, and again, Jesus predicted this in Matthew chapter 24. He says, the love of many will grow cold and blessed are those who endure to the end. Basically saying that a lot of people aren't going to make it to the end. A lot of people are going to renounce their faith. So maybe the devil understands because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, the forces of hell will not overpower the church institution. The church will never completely fall. Maybe the devil thinks if he can take out enough individuals, enough pastors, enough worship leaders, enough congregants, that it will, it will slowly erode the faith. It will kill the faith. And so maybe that's what he starts to do. He starts to wage war against the people of the church. Now, this is very important. I told you to remember this. The offspring that Satan wants to destroy are defined. I need you to hear this. This is very important. Who are the offspring of God, right? It says, it tells us, they keep the commands of God. It's important and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, and they keep his commands. The reason why this is so important is we throw out the word Christian extremely haphazardly in our society. Right now in the United States, 63% of the United States claims to be Christian. Do you buy that? Nor do I. Of that 63%, only 44% of them ever go to church at all. That doesn't mean consistently. It just means ever go to church. Only half of the 63% go to church ever. Of that, you continue to study the statistics. Of that, it's like 5% of them ever financially contribute. It's like 10 to 12% ever serve their community at all. I mean, like, it looks very, very bleak. So the numbers do not support the claim that the majority of the United States are Christians. And I think the reason why is because we don't even know what a Christian is, biblically speaking. But right here, it's defined for us. What is, in, what is a Christian? Those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. Now, we'll go into that a little bit more. Let me circle back around, though. The first thing that we need to take from chapter 12 is this. We need to remember that we are eternal. I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, all of you are going to live forever. The question is not, are you going to live forever? The question is, as to where will you live forever? That is the question. Now, this body will eventually break down. It will decay. It will fall apart. It will die. But our souls live forever. And one day we will all be given an eternal body, right? That will last forever. Now, again, the question is not, will we live forever? Will we live forever in the presence of God? Or will we live forever away from God, eternally separated from God? Now, Corey, that's heavy. Yes, that is eternity. That's a, that's a big deal. That's there's nothing bigger than that. That's a big deal. And because it is such a big deal, there is a war going on for your eternal soul. Again, Corey sounds heavy. Absolutely. What is happening is there is a loving God that is fighting for you, right? Sent his only son to die for you. He loves you. He is for you. And then we have an adversary that we have learned in chapter 12 is a smart adversary and a powerful adversary. And he hates you. Why? He hates you because God loves you so much. He hates you because you look like God. He can't take out God. He can't take out the angels. So he's going to do his best to take out the only thing in the universe that resembles God. That is you. And he comes at us with all of his force because he knows his time is limited. Now, the good news is this. We may be persecuted we may be hurt, we may even be killed, but we do not have to live in fear of evil. Why? This is important. That's why it's in blue up here. 
Because true followers are promised victory through the cross and by not only remembering God's mercy, grace, and love, but sharing God's mercy, grace, and love. So we don't have to be afraid of whatever comes our way, right? Remember, John is interrupted in the middle of the movie and a voice from heaven says, John, we're going to win, right? Nothing to be afraid of. We're going to win. We're going to win if we lean on the blood of the cross and live in and share the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God with others. Others. Now, we do not fight this spiritual battle for our souls with flesh and blood. It's not like the movies, right? I know it's fun to watch movies like that sometimes, Keanu Reeves with like a cross-shaped shotgun shooting demons. I know it's kind of fun, right? But it's not reality. The reality is, Constantine, that's the movie. The reality is <laughs> that we fight this battle through prayer, by talking to God, leaning on God. We fight this battle through the word of God. If you were at the prayer night Friday, one of my favorite parts was Hannah, one of our student pastors, reading some scripture and then just praying the scripture. And I was like, man, that was powerful. That was really, really good. That we fight this battle through prayer, through the word, and we fight this battle by being a witness of Jesus. We overcome evil by living out our faith because it affects other people. It blesses other people. It converts other people. This is how we fight the battle. Now, I'm going to show you something, and, and stuff like this causes so much vitriolic criticism only by Christians. It's not non-Christians that criticize this. It's Christians that criticize this. I've been saying this stuff for years. The reason why I say it is because it's biblical. But what I will do is I will get up here, and I'll get up in front of a large group of people, and now, you know, as the church has grown and people who don't live in this area, you know, watch sermons and little clips and judge your entire character and life on a 20-second thing, as people start to do that more and more and more, they will hear me say things like, if you are not living by the principles of the Bible, I would be concerned about your salvation. And they go, oh my God, how dare dare he? How dare he look at my life and make a judgment that I'm a believer or not a believer based on my actions? I'm going to tell you how I dare. You ready? Here it is. It's right here. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, do you know what Jesus, I, I paraphrased here. I said, we will know a tree by its fruit. Do you know what Jesus actually says in Matthew chapter 7? He says, you will know a tree by its fruit. Jesus already knows. Ultimately, Jesus is the judge of who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. But what Jesus has done has given us his word. And by the standards of this word, we should be able to look at one another, not because we hate one another, but because we should be looking out for one another. We should be able to look at each other's thoughts, actions. I know we can't look at thoughts, but how we demonstrate our thoughts, our actions, our words, how we treat other people. And if those things don't align with the scripture we can make a pretty fair assessment that that person is not a true follower of Jesus. Right, Corey, how dare you? I just showed you. Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. It's like, I use the analogy all the time. I walk up in an orchard. I walk up to a tree that is covered with lemons. And it says, I am an apple tree. And I say, well, but you have lemons all over you. But I say, I am an apple tree. Can I, can I, can I, Oh, hold, no, hold on, because I don't, I don't want it to be taken out of context, but I want you to hear me. The same Christians who take shots at confused people who are maybe one gender, but say, I am a different gender, and Christians ridicule them and say, you're idiots and you're more, listen, I'm not agreeing with transgenderism, but the same criticism of that crowd, the same group of people say, I'm a Christian, but there is absolutely no evidence that you are. The same level, it is the same thing. Now, I don't agree with either one. So that's what I don't want to be taken out of context. But the same people who go, you can't say your one thing and have no proof of it. Correct. You can't. And the same goes with our walk with God. This means that there, is, there should be visible evidence of true faith. How do we know? Jesus said it. Again, is he ultimately the judge? Yes, he is ultimately the judge. But a true Christian should be a witness of their faith by how they live, by how they talk, by how they act, by how they love others. The Bible even says that you'll be known by how you love others and how you treat others. That's how they will identify you. 
And we get so, Christians get so offended when you make the audacious claim that post-salvation should look differently than pre-salvation. Even though Romans chapter six says the old self has died and a new one has been born. (coughs) How dare you? Just Bible, just Bible. That's how we do it. So the question is, what does a Christian look like? Now, John 3.16 is a good starting point, right? Jesus, Jesus talked about this, that our faith and trust must be put into his identity, who he is, whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life, that we believe that it is not our work that saves us. It is nothing we have done that has saved us. It is by the work of the cross, by putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's how we are saved. Jesus said it, Corey, there's nothing else that we have to do. That is it. Jesus laid it down in John 3, 16. It's interesting The same Jesus in the same book of the Bible in chapter 14 says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Corey, are you saying I have to live a certain way to be a Christian? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands, which leads us to believe if you don't keep my commands, you don't love me. That's just what a logical person would deduce from that. So the same Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. The same Jesus said, it will be those that endure till the end will be saved. That don't give up in the middle of pressure, right? The same Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 10 and in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said that. The same Jesus in John 13 said that not only are we to love God with all of our hearts, we are to love others as we love ourselves. So how we love others matters. The same Jesus said that. So another mark of the Christian is to be in fellowship in the local church. Corey, are you telling me I have to go to church to be a Christian? I'm telling you the author of Hebrews said that. The author of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as many have done. But as the closer that Jesus's return gets, meet more and more and more. That's what the Bible says. Well, that's the only place. It's not. In 1 Corinthians, Paul makes a reference. He says this. He says, some people say they they follow Peter. Some people follow Paul. Some people follow Apollos. And some people say, well, I just follow Jesus. Now, the reason he throws Jesus in there is he's making two points. One, we're not to exclusively follow just a pastor, right? That, that, That a pastor is there to help you and lead you, but ultimately I'm not your salvation. I can teach the word to you. Maybe I can model the word to the best of my abilities, but ultimately I'm not your hope. But there's another group of people that say, I don't have to go to church. I follow Jesus. And John's saying that's a bunch of bull crap too, because Jesus created the institution of the church because we need each other. Now, again, ultimately, yes, that's who we follow, but God has put men and women in our lives to keep us accountable and to shepherd us. And the Bible even says, it's not good that man do this alone. We're meant to do it in community, right? It's a mark of a Christian. One who displays the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Now, Galatians chapter 5, let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit for a second. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these things. Now, this doesn't mean that we have these things perfected. I don't expect any of us to have these things perfected. But the fruit should at least be on the branches, They should at least be growing. We should be nurturing it, watering it, fertilizing it, hoping that that fruit matures into something. Now, again, if you're a man in this room, you're like, oh, he said patience. We don't have that mastered, right? But we should be working on that fruit. We may not have love mastered, but we need to be working on that, striving to display the principles and the fruit that God wants us to display. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that God distributes those as he sees fit, but we know we should know what the, 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 the gifts are. We should pray that God uses us however he wants to use us in those gifts. And we should display those things. We learned in this chapter, a, a, a hallmark of a true follower and offspring is that we are willing to give it all. That I would lay it all down for Jesus. I would lay it all down for Jesus. If it came to it and I had to give up everything, would I do it? We need to be at a place where we would say, yes, I don't love my life unto the death, right? That, that, that I would give my life. Revelation chapter 12, again, Matthew chapter 10, that we have to lose our life in order to find life. 
And again, guys, these things don't have to be perfected or fully mature in our life, but there does have to be evidence that Christ has touched our heart. If there is no evidence, listen to me, what is the point of salvation if we don't change? What is the point of salvation if nothing is different? That if we're going to be the offspring, there should be a change in our life. We're not perfect. I use the analogy all the time. If the devil and sin and the ways of the world are this wall and Jesus Christ and perfection and holiness is that wall, we may not have reached all the way to the other side yet, but we should be moving further away from this and closer to that. And we should be able to see a progression in our life. And again, this is the stuff that people just hate my guts over. But if we're not seeing that, That's the reason why Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthians. We have two books of the Bible solely because Paul, that judgmental jerk that he was, that Paul saw a bunch of people who claimed to be Christians but were not living it out. And he wrote two books of the Bible about it, saying, I'm worried about you. If you were with me when I taught 1 and 2 Corinthians, that's essentially what those whole letters are about. I, I would not be much of a pastor. You wouldn't be much of a brother or sister in Christ If I'm cheating on my wife and looking at porn and lying on my taxes and treating people like garbage and walking around saying I'm a Christian, you wouldn't be much of a brother or sister. I wouldn't be much of a pastor if I didn't say, man, I am worried about you. I am worried about your eternal soul. How dare you? Because I love you. This is why Jesus said at the beginning of Revelation, I discipline you because I love you. Because I love you. I point these things out, not because I'm a judgmental jerk, not because I'm trying to to, to play God and say that I get to choose who goes to heaven. I don't. But you will know a tree by its fruit. Jesus said it, Matthew chapter seven. Okay, We need to make sure that we are displaying the fruit. Not perfect, but being nurtured and it growing. We need to make sure that we're displaying that. Okay, Would you bow your heads with me, please?